ask you to note the position of the exit nearest where you are now seated. There are in all 10 exit doors from the concert hall, all of which are clearly marked. In the unlikely event of an emergency, please move calmly to the nearest exit and make your way to the outside of the building, following the instructions of the staff. Do not delay and do not return unless and until you are advised by the staff that it is safe to do so. We hope you enjoy the performance in comfort and safety. And we request that all mobile devices and alarms be switched off for the duration of the performance. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the National Concert Hall. If you are here in person, you're very, very, very welcome. If you're joining us online, you're equally as welcome as we present to you a selection of pieces of set works from the Junior Certificate. My name is Tom Redmond, this is our conductor Gavin Maloney and this is the RTE National Symphony Orchestra. Now we're going to begin, like many concerts do, with an overture, an overture by the composer Mozart, composer from the classical period, 1730 to 1820, but not exactly. When you're thinking of the musical periods, they don't start on the 1st of January of those years. Slightly more elastic, but that's roughly what we think of when we think of this musical period. The characteristics Classical music are long, melodic lines with a simple accompaniment. So we end up with homophonic music. We end up with melody and accompaniment. Also in this piece of music, we hear polyphony, polyphonic music, multiple melodic voices of equal importance. And then we look at the structure of the piece and we have something that is a shortened sonata form. So we have an exposition and we have a recapitulation, but no development in the middle. Now, we can think of all those things but Mozart really didn't when he was composing it, which was just a couple of hours before the first performance of the opera The Marriage of Figaro, which is where this overture is from. Quite often we can overanalyze a piece of music, but this really was performed with the ink still dripping on the page for the players in the pit in the opera theatre. So we're going to hear it now in its entirety to get things going. Music by Mozart, music of excitement, of energy, of brilliance, and... If it's played at the right speed, the ultimate egg timer. This piece of music should last exactly four minutes. So if you were to put an egg in a pan of boiling water and listen to this overture, by the end of it, you should have the perfect breakfast. <laughs> Thank you. 
Perhaps Mozart isn't the best role model on some levels. That idea of leaving the overture to moments before the first performance of your opera is like leaving it to the night before to revise for an exam. Probably best not to do that, but you can hear his brilliance in that music. We're going to jump forward now to the Romantic period, basically the 19th century with a decade or two either end. Now, at this time in history, music began to grow on many levels. The orchestra grew. They got bigger. We had more players on stage. The brass section extended. The woodwind section got larger. Far more percussion. And the strings also got larger. The first violin started to extend, as did the seconds, cellos and violas. And what composers expressed also grew as well. Composers started to explore greater levels of emotion. They started to explore the whole human condition and put that into their music. Quite often, with a narrative, program music, the idea of telling a specific story in sound really came large in the Romantic period. And that's what we're going to play you now. We're going to play you music that describes action on a stage, incidental music from the play Peer Gint, written by the composer Ibsen, music written by the Norwegian composer Edvard Grieg. Now, this is one of your set works, and you have to know three of the four movements of the first suite of music. We're only going to play three today, but I urge you to listen to the absent movement, Orza's Death, which is so beautiful, so painfully beautiful in its sound and simplicity. And I think to really hear this music, you have to have that complete picture in mind. We're going to play, as I say, three movements, Morning Mood, a Nietzsche's Dance, and In the Hall of the Mountain King. And before we play them all three together, we're going to take each one apart a little bit and just look at the different textures and ideas that Grieg uses in this music. So it's telling a story, telling a story of Pierre Gint, who is this Norwegian folk hero. Um, again, not really a role model in many ways. He was a bad man, ultimately. Uh, and this story, the play, is long and complex. But it begins with Peer Gint gate crashing a wedding. He tries to persuade the bride that she should love him instead of her husband. His mother gets very cross. He still lives at home. She kicks him out, and he goes off and has many, many adventures that take him all over the world in all sorts of far-fetched and ridiculous situations, but also brilliant at the same time. We're going to join him now with the sun rising. Now, this isn't, as many people might think, the sun rising over a Norwegian fjord. This is the sun rising over a desert, because after an interesting adventure with some milkmaids and some strong liqueur, Piergin ends up finding himself living with a Bedouin tribe. So in the middle of the desert, he sees the sun rise. We have music in ternary form, so A, B, A, with interesting textures, very simple textures, homophonic, melody, and accompaniment. Let's just hear the first rays of sun. the melody in the flute, followed by the oboe. Simple chordal accompaniment in the violins. And the bassoon. So again, it's just that idea of the first rays of sunshine just creeping over the horizon. And then as it comes up higher, we hear the sun richer and warmer as the strings take the melody and the woodwind have the accompaniment. So a very bright, powerful sunrise over this great desert landscape. So that's the first section of this piece. Then we get to the second section, which we arrive to from this cascading feature in the strings. Let's just hear that extract now. So he uses the strings to take us to the second theme, which we hear in the cellos. We're just going to hear the cellos play it on their own. So we get that falling feature of the strings, and he uses that to take us from A to B, and also B back to A. But for now, let's just hear the second theme played by the cellos. So 
So it's a simpler melody than the one we heard at the very start. It's a simple melody, but the accompaniment becomes far more complex. The original melody at the very beginning was moving with a chordal accompaniment. This time we have a simple melody with a far more extrovert accompaniment. Okay, so now let's put that all together and hear everybody from the third bar of C. Cascading feature again that takes us to the return of the first melody that we hear in its second utterance played by the horn, a darker, almost like the sun in its sort of midday glow. Now let's move to Anitra's dance. So this is at the same point of the story where Piergint is with a Bedouin tribe. Anitra is the daughter of the Bedouin chief and she takes a shine to Piergint with his striking, strong Norwegian features. He's a very handsome man and so she tries to enchant him with her dancing. Let's just hear a little bit from the beginning, describe this exotic dance that we hear. There are lots of things to look at there, or to listen to. The first of all is the inclusion of a triangle, a very exotic instrument, like bells on the end of Anitra's sleeves. Just listen to the triangle on its own. It's a thing of great beauty and virtuosity, and I think a little round of applause. Thank you very much. So the triangle adds a certain color to the music. And the way that Grieg colors the rest of the orchestra is also important. So he's playing a mazurka, which is a Polish dance with emphasis on the second and third beats. And you can hear that in the pizzicato accompaniment. Now, pizzicato plucked in the strings, and the first violins who have the melody are playing with mutes on, which sort of softens the sound and gives it a different type of glow. But had Grieg orchestrated it differently, the mood of the music would have changed enormously. So I'm going to ask the strings to play everybody now, arco, with bows and with no mutes. And just listen to how this piece changes character. much, much heavier, isn't it? It's not the same sort of light, exotic dance we heard before. It was real kind of folk music that time, with sort of a stamping in the cellos on the downbeat of each bar. And the violin sound is sort of too bright, too full to be sort of exotic and enchanting like a Nietzsche is. But now let's imagine that everybody, even the melody, was played pizzicato, plucked. And what might that sound like? Now it's less like a dance and more like trying not to be seen, isn't it? It's like you're sort of creeping away from something, which is a technique he uses in the next movement, the Hall of the Mountain King. So it's that perfection of orchestration that leads to this sound of a Nietzsche dancing. We've got ornaments as well in the melody that give it sort of, I don't know, more of a shimmying feel, if you like. Now, let's just hear the second subject of a Nietzsche's dance. Again, we're in ternary form, so A, B, A. The middle section sounds like this. more pleading in the sound. Mm -hmm. 
So you see, Anita is ultimately trying to seduce Pia Gint with her dance. And we come to the next point, and the cellos take on an important role. Basically, we have a dialogue between Anitra in the first violins and Pia Gint in the cellos, this sort of rich Daniel Craig-like voice that the cellos can create and the seductive qualities of the first violins. And we hear them start to have a conversation. Let's just hear. So she's saying, please dance with me, please. I'd love it if you stood up and danced. He's paying no attention, trying to look the other way. She pleads again. Don't really like dancing. Not for me. Please. I just don't want to dance. But maybe if you ask me again, I will. Okay. And he joins in, because for all his good intentions, Pierre Gint is a weak man and can't resist the dance with a Bedouin tribal daughter. Thank you. And that dance continues well into the night. And that's the sort of thing that quite often gets Pierre Gint in trouble throughout this story, which is how he finds himself then in the hall of the mountain king, a troll king who's very unhappy with Pierre Gint. Um, for reasons we probably won't go into before the watershed. Musically, this is a melodic ostinato. Grieg builds this entire piece of music on one simple idea. We'll just hear it played by the cellos and the basses. So pizzicato, feeling of tiptoe. Throughout the piece, we hear that 18 times as Grieg develops it through crescendo, getting louder, a cellarando, getting faster. So there's the melody, which comes with the accompaniment played by the bassoons. And just listen out to in this section for the horns. This is the second extract. So sort of stomping in the bassoons. Now listen to the horns. Here they are. You hear that slightly nasal sound from the horns, like they're speaking like that. It's like a bah! And they're using their hands to cover the end of the instrument to create that color. Horns, play it open for us, would you? Just play us those two notes without mutes, hands. So that's a very full sound, but what Grieg's trying to create is this idea of magical troll-like creatures. So they use their hands to make that sort of yep, nasal sound, as I say. Let's just hear it on its own. You'll see that in the score, marked gestopped, which means hand-stopped. So that ostinato continues, and we hear it played at various pitches, various registers around the orchestra. Let's hear the next extract where we hear it played much higher by the violins, like this chase is gaining momentum. It's an urgency because of the pitch of the violins at this point. And in the middle of it, the violas are doing something else. Let's just stop there. And violas, can we just hear what you're doing? Play it nice and strong. Sort of this feeling of grabbing, isn't it? Like these trolls are trying to catch up with Pierre Gint. And that's what's happening as he starts to make his way out of the cave to try and escape from the king himself. Now that music, as you know, grows in intensity, grows in speed and dynamic until we arrive at this cliffhanger ending which is what we're going to hear now at the end of these three movements from Pierre Gint's first suite by Edvard Grieg.
From hungry man-eating trolls in Norway, we're going to go back to the Baroque period and the music of Antonio Vivaldi. Vivaldi was a very, very important composer who for a long time disappeared and was forgotten. In his lifetime, he was hugely famous. And when he died, his music seemed to disappear, literally disappear. And it wasn't until the middle of the 20th century that someone found a box in an attic full of his manuscripts, all of Vivaldi's music, and it suddenly had this surge in popularity again. He was a pioneer in so many ways. He designed the modern concerto form that we know, this idea of a soloist standing in front of the orchestra, of having a fast movement, a slow movement, a fast movement. He was ahead of the game when it came to adding words to his music, adding narrative. We didn't normally expect that to happen for another 200 years. But he was a teacher. He worked in an orphanage where he taught orphan girls, the trade of music. He taught them how to improvise, how to sing, how to play. So when they left, they could go off and find employment in the big houses around Italy. We're going to hear the first movement of his concerto, Winter, from the Four Seasons. It's going to feature our soloist, Elaine. And I'd like a little round of applause, please. That's a big one. So this is music of the Baroque, and there are certain things we have to listen out for. Baroque music is defined, I think, by its architecture of the time as well. Flamboyant, heavily ornamented architecture, very different to the architecture of the classical period, like Mozart's time, which had very clean lines. So this is heavily decorated music. But if you ever want to sort of define Baroque music by a sound, then it has to come from the harpsichord, this instrument over there. Very, very important in Baroque music. Just listen to this sound. There we go. And if you hear that in a piece, you can almost guarantee that it's Baroque. And if it doesn't sound like it's very old, it's very contemporary harpsichord music, and there's a clear difference. Now, harpsichord is part of the continuo section of an orchestra. The orchestra is structured slightly different at this time. So we have the soloist, the concerto soloist, and then we have another small group of players called the ripieno, which means padding. And then we have the continuo, which is basically the bass line. Now, if we just hear what a continuo bass line sounds like without harpsichord, Thanks. You might say that that was unimaginative writing. You know, they're just repeating the one note over and over again. It needs the harpsichord to bring that continuo part to life. Harpsichord players were like modern jazz musicians in the way that they could improvise and embellish what they have on a page. So let's listen to the continuo now with the harpsichord.
completely different, isn't it? But he has the same music, but he has figured bass, just a series of numbers underneath those notes that allow the harpsichord player to, to develop, to improvise over those notes given. And it might be different each time. He might join the notes together in a different way. Brilliant, brilliant musicians of the period. And that's what Vivaldi was teaching, how to improvise, how to entertain using an instrument like a harpsichord. Now, Vivaldi wrote his own sonnets, his own poems, to go with the four seasons. Shivering frozen mid the frosty snow in biting, stinging winds, running to and fro to stamp one's icy feet, teeth chattering in the bitter chill. And he describes those words in sound. So I'm just going to go through some of those lines so you can hear them, and then we'll hear the piece as a whole. So the first solo violin entry is the first line of that poem, shivering frozen mid the frosty snow, the sound of shivering. Quite violent shivering, but shivering nonetheless, thank you. The next entry is this idea of running to and fro to keep warm, stamping your feet in the snow. We're going to hear the orchestra play this at sea. Quite active as well, isn't it? But that idea of just trying to keep warm when it's freezing. Now, the next bit, teeth chattering in the bitter chill. Can you not play? It's nothing personal. <laughs> just want to hear this effect in the first violins here. Let's hear the sound of teeth chattering. I think that's absolutely incredible. You, know, you can try it. Like, 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 you know? Thanks. You can really imagine that feeling of uncontrollable shivering. And you hear it just played by the violins. They're just using the wood of the bow against the strings rather than the hair. It's a very, very different effect, very simple effect, but really brings that line to life. So now we're going to hear the whole of the first movement of Winter by Vivaldi from The Four Seasons.
Elaine Clark. But from frozen Italian landscapes to America in the Midwest and music by Aaron Copeland from his ballet Rodeo. We're going to hear the hoedown, this great lively cowboy dance that sort of really put Copeland on the map. He's known as the Dean of American Music. He created this national sound of American composers in the same way that in the Romantic period, 100 years before, in the 19th century, composers all around Europe had been drawing on influences of folk music of their countries. Copeland did that a century later, drawing on American influence to create a very distinctive American sound. Now, the hoedown is in three sections, where ABA, so we're in ternary form again, texture, homophonic, and it's always based on American folk tunes, as I say, to tell this story, a story of a cowgirl who, throughout the ballet, has fallen in love with the head rancher. And she thinks he's absolutely great. He's not. He's an absolute idiot. Uh, and by the end of the ballet, she's realized this, and she's decided, actually, someone much nicer is worthy of her affections. And that's the point. We find the point in this music where they meet, their relationship is cemented, and everyone lives happily ever after, and they have a party. So musically, there are a few different ideas in this piece that we should hear. The first is the Rodeo theme, music that links together the entire ballet. <laughs> of a very distinctive cowboy sound, isn't it? You can sort of swagger along to the little bit and sort of slap your thigh if you were so inclined. Now, the two main ideas are sort of ABA, are taken from old American folk tunes. The first one is called Bonaparte, and you can see it on the screen. It looks very simple. Now, folk music is traditionally passed down orally. Very rarely is it written down, but this is it on its most basic level. How Copeland uses it is massively embellished. So if you can see it there and hear now the whole orchestra play, how Copeland treats that material. <laughs> It's the same, but it's different. But it is definitely that folk reel, a very distinctive American sound. The next is more easy to follow, easy to follow. It's called Miss McLeod's Reel. This is the second section, and this is played by the trumpet. <laughs> Now, I just want to draw your attention to the percussion section once again, a very big percussion section in this music. And although there's only one note, one sort of rim shot coming from a snare drum, it's a very important sound. And the only way to appreciate how brilliant the percussionists are is to take them away. So I want to hear that again, but without the snare drum. <laughs> It's only a tiny thing, just a few hits of a drum, but it changes the color of the music. Carefully placed snare drum solos throughout that piece, and it really, really does make a difference, I believe, in the general character of the music. Now, hidden within that second subject, there's one other reel, an Irish reel called Gilderoy, and it gets passed between the oboes, the clarinets, and then the first violin. and then he takes us back to Miss McLeod again. Now, just towards the end of this piece, a very significant moment in the narrative of the whole story. We hear the Rodeo theme again, and there's a great big slowdown, and one instrument I want you to listen out for. Let's just hear this extract. So there's the Rodeo, sort of cowboy swagger. Big cowboy, played by the trombone, sort of slowly arriving. Tilts his hat. And a Celeste. Again, it's a tiny thing, but just listen to that Celeste chord on its own. 
Now that instrument, in all music, is always represents magic, if you like. Tchaikovsky introduced the instrument to the world in his ballet, The Nutcracker, a magical story. John Williams uses that instrument a lot in all his magical films. Harry Potter is the most obvious example. And that simple chord is the moment, it's really quite disgusting, actually, it's the moment where the cowgirl kisses the cowboy. That's what that represents. So, there you go. Try and get that in an exam paper as we play you Aaron Copeland's Hoedown. Now, music from film, and from, I believe, the greatest film composer of all time, John Williams. We're going to hear music from Star Wars, or more specifically, The Empire Strikes Back. Now, film music works in the same way that the incidental music of Edvard Grieg does. You know, this idea that music is enhancing the drama on the stage. But just like Grieg, John Williams realized that his music so brilliantly written that it stands alone as a concert piece, that you can still hear this and imagine the drama on the stage or the screen, just as you could with Trolls chasing Pierre Gint. And not all film music likes this. Some of it doesn't work without film. 
But this really, really does. It's an interesting sort of twist. If you take film away from music, it works. But if you take the music away from film, it really, really doesn't. Because with no soundtrack, you know, Superman pulling his shirt open is just a bloke with a blue vest on. You know, it just doesn't work. And, and Thor is a bloke with a hammer. But with an orchestra, he's suddenly the god of thunder. And Darth Vader, actually, maybe he would be menacing without his soundtrack. But it certainly enhances him, if you like. And when you hear this melody, you can't help but imagine this evil, terrifying Sith Lord. Now, John Williams draws on the techniques of Wagner, great romantic opera composer, and the idea of leitmotif, that each character in a drama should have its own signature theme tune, if you like. And that is Darth Vader's there up on the screen, a simple melody. And every time Vader is near or he's being thought about, there are always suggestions of that melody. Sometimes you hear it played very, very high. Sometimes it's just sort of a very slow, menacing rumbling. And it's used throughout the Star Wars universe, if you like. If you listen very carefully, if you are as sad as I am, and you sit to the very, very end of the credits of a film like The Phantom Menace, you know, where you see young Anakin Skywalker, if you stay to the end, there's just a moment where you hear that played just delicately, a suggestion of the evil that's going to unfold in the galaxy. But now we're going to hear it in its fullest form from its first appearance in The Empire Strikes Back, when Vader was his most terrifying, when he was searching the galaxy for his long-lost son to try and convert him to the dark side of the Force. <laughs>
We're going to finish uh, well, with something completely different. Uh, no Sith Lords in our last piece of music as we turn to a composer called Benjamin Britten, one of the most important composers, I think, of the 20th century. Now, Britten was an English composer who lived and worked in a small village called Oldborough, which is just on the southeast coast of England. It's a very, very beautiful place, and he was completely and utterly inspired by his landscape. The sea there is quite unlike anything else, and he used to describe this often in his music. So he was inspired by landscape, and he was also inspired by a real belief in what music could be, that what music was in a community, what it was in a society, and how to reach as far as he could to engage people in a way that no one else really had before. And one of the best ways he did that was with a piece of music called The Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra, which was, as the title suggests, a way to make young people listen to an orchestra. It's a set of variations on a theme by another English composer called Henry Purcell. And before we do anything else, we're going to hear Purcell's music that Britain bases this upon. Britain put great weight and emphasis on the great composers of the past, the structure and the forms of what had gone before. So variations are very important, and he finishes The Young Person's Guide with a fugue. You know, throughout this piece, he takes the orchestra to pieces. He introduces each instrument with a variation based on Purcell's music. We're not going to play it all, because it's about 25 minutes. We're going to take the last three minutes, the fugue, where he puts the orchestra back together using that classic technique of the Baroque period, you know, this form pioneered by Bach, if you like, of, of a fugue. And he does this starting with the tiniest instrument in the orchestra, the piccolo, and then introduces different subjects of the fugue theme as we go along. We're just going to hear what a fugue sounds like. Basically, independent lines of music that form together to create harmony. Just listen to the woodwind play their fugue entries. Then he adds the flute. Then the big oboe. There's the clarinet. And the bassoon. And then he goes through the entire orchestra, putting it all together in a fugue. Now, you notice each one of those entries throughout the woodwind is a fifth lower, and it keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. Now, Britain knew that if he carried on like that, then by the time he got to the strings, they were going to be playing well beyond their actual range. So he starts to change the key, he starts to play with that material, he starts to modulate and introduce different ideas to those fugal subjects, until eventually we arrive at a point where the whole brass section plays the original theme of Henry Purcell. So we're going to put that together now, the whole orchestra in fugue, in music by Britain, inspired by Purcell. Thank you. 
Gavin Maloney in the RTE National Symphony Orchestra. Thank you very much. See you next time.